Welcome, Jeff, to the Business and Society series. Welcome. We're so glad to have you today. My it's pleasure. such an honor. Uh, we've been watching you at the Executive Forum uh, talk about topics such as the gap between the haves and the have-nots. And so Dick um, and I, both of whom are heavily involved in the Center for Professional and Applied Ethics over at UNC Charlotte, and who get to work with the Bell College of Business, and mm -hmm. I know you're a big booster of theirs, um, thought that it'd be great for you to sort of talk about not only the economic and political issues surrounding the gap between the haves and have-nots, but some of the ethical issues um, between the haves and the have-nots. And I guess my first question to you would be um, exactly what makes a have a have and a have not a have not? And how does this vary from society to society? And uh, how does one land in one group or another? And I'm not interested right now in making any value judgments about who's in the haves and who's in the have nots. Sure. We can talk about that later. But just to understand, uh, is this just a matter of take home salary or is it a matter of family wealth or what you own? So um, why don't you tell us sure. more about I'll, this? Sure. So that question's for me and not for. Not, no, not, I'm going to have not, Dick not, join it. If you answer the wrong way, then I'm going to have Dick correct you. Uh, understood. Well, let me, let me start off by saying my pleasure being okay. here. And I've talked to both of you on this topic yes. uh, often, so it's something near and dear to my heart. And I will start off by saying I do so many presentations that I do need to make sure that, that you know in this particular case I'm speaking on my own behalf and giving you my opinion and not the, the opinion of the Federal Reserve. Oh, well, because, we, uh, we'd rather have yeah, your opinion. The yeah, other one's right, too scary. Right, the other, the other, <laughs> the other but the, in this case it, it truly is me. Uh, you know, as I think about this topic, uh, I, I put it into, into really three buckets. Uh, in terms of the first bucket, and, and, and I would couch this as to whether there is a gap. Buckets, okay. I, I think it's irrefutable in terms of the mountains of evidence that would point to the fact that not only is there a gap, but that gap is widening, and it's probably as wide in the U.S. Uh, compared to any other uh, present-day economy that, 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 that we would have any data on. You mean developed and developing? Uh, well, no, I, I do d d developed, and developed. I would say primarily uh, looking at, at the European, uh, mm. European Union. Uh, in and, and I'll give you some of, some of the highlights that would point to that. Uh, if you look at not only uh, the distribution of the, of the top 1%, it, mm -hmm. it's pretty well, uh, well documented that that top 1% of wage earners has moved from say 1980 to somewhere from around 8 percent of, of total income to somewhere in the 16, 17 percent mm -hmm. range now. Okay, well that's fairly well documented, but there's also data that gets to household income that can be broken out if you look at it geographically. I've got some information on the Charlotte region that basically would point to the fact that 65 percent of the jobs that are available in the Charlotte metro area would generate less than forty thousand dollars a year if, if put on that's an annual for basis. Single that's for a single job. Now, in terms of a, a family, uh, fifty-five percent of the families in the Charlotte area, according to some of the chamber data, uh, would be less than fifty thousand dollars. And, and I use that forty and fifty not to say that that's the range of have and have not, uh, but if you look at the factors of housing costs, transportation costs, and other facts, that's. Uh, that's it. That's but a. just the gaps. That, that that's a point of of uh, where it'd be very difficult. I can't imagine raising a family of four on fifty five thousand dollars, factoring sure. in all of those elements. So the fact that there is a gap, and I could point to cr things like credit scores, uh, high school graduation rates. There are so many data sets that point to the fact that it exists. Mm -hmm. That I think that's well documented. When you get to the why factor and more particularly whether there is something that we should do or what types of things should uh, we, we do about it. I think that's where more of the debate around the haves and have-nots uh, are. Uh, and I, if you were to say, well, in my view, how have we gotten here, there are an awful lot of factors. But I think there are three that stand out in, 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 uh, in my mind. Uh, number one, the increase in technology and the elimination of a lot of jobs uh, that used to be performed uh, on a low-skill basis. 
I think, you know, th there's some that would argue that that's a permanent uh, mm -hmm. shift in terms of the global economy. And I do, I do think the global economy has had some factor to play in that. Uh, if you look at uh, things like single parent households and some of the data sets around there, clearly there are some cultural changes that have, uh, the, the right. typical American family is no longer the mom, the dad, the three kids, and the dog, and maybe a cat. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a very different looking family uh, family unit. So thinking of all of those uh, those elements, I think would would lend us to the to the further part of our discussion here, which would be yeah. the moral implications and, and what is it that we yeah. should do about it. I just talking about the, the gap between the haves and the have-nots, and you're expressing what probably makes you a have-not in the Charlotte area. Mm -hmm. You'd say, well, certainly if it's under fifty-five thousand and you're supporting a whole family, you're in the have-not group, yeah. and so on. I was just kind of speculating maybe this is where Dick could come in or you could come in yourself thinking back to my childhood about how easy or how hard it was to get out of the have not group mm -hmm. into the have group and um, I grew up in the have not group mm -hmm. and, but we had a stable family structure. It was a small like Czech ethnic community, uh, very working class factory workers probably made the equivalent of, um, I would say, you know, kind of a minimal wage until the unions came in and of course the unions boosted that up and so on. But what got me out of that group or whatever, and there's mixed feelings about it even when I talk about it, I have like a divided conscience or consciousness about the values of that old time and the values mm -hmm. of the haves. Um, getting out of it, it was education and it was just hammered at me that the only way out, actually that's how it was expressed to me, was the only way you're gonna have something better than us is education, education, education. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what your experience was, Dick, or where you came from, or where you came from, Jeff, mm -hmm. but that was the, the meal ticket. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, it, I was fairly similar yeah. uh, to you, not not quite as have-not-ish, but, uh, but certainly not not wealthy, but entirely stable, and uh, education was was absolutely it. There was never a question about uh, getting a pretty solid education. Well, and, the, and the that part was the that scares out. me about it, and where I'd like you to enter in about how easy is it to move from the have-nots <clears> to the haves. Um, when I kind of look at society now and going to that structure, let's say, which is divorces, remarriages, single parents, uh, never married. Uh, multiple relationships, uh, going from job to job, there's no mm -hmm. job stability either. Um, it seems incredibly difficult. I say to myself, it was hard for me mm -hmm. to try to, through education and not having connections, to kind of emerge from that, you know, small townish, you know, environment into the big city of right. whatever. Um, but um, how much more difficult it must be nowadays? I mean, I mean the obstacles seem so great. What, no, what is your I, take? I, I think my take would be similar. The uh, I don't. I I think to a great extent, the the magnitude of this of this gap that exists really exists more so in terms of of two factors. And in the upper end, it's yeah. just the the uh, if you look at aggregate incomes at the upper end, it's clear there would have to be a gap. I mean, looking at salaries of Fortune 500 CEOs and looking at what that's done over the last 10 years would, would, would be staggering, to, to tell you, on the upper end. Uh, it, but I tell you, when I pull up to the pump myself, I feel like I have not. And I okay. think an interesting thing uh, now is when you, uh, I went back and looked at some of the, some of the 07 uh, literature mm -hmm. around this topic and, and there was actually a survey conducted where people were asked are you or have or have not and it's amazing how many people view themselves as haves that may be at this uh, family income of fifty five thousand dollars a lot of that has to do with it's more than just salary uh, do you have stock investments real estate investments I know we'll probably talk a little bit about real estate but you know income is one side of the equation assets uh, that are handed down on a family basis or another side mm -hmm. of, the, of, of the equation and I think that makes a big difference in, in an individual's ability to, to weather the economic circumstances mm -hmm. uh, that we're in. If you're a single parent household with, uh, with 
four kids now and you don't have that asset base behind you. That would be extremely, extremely, extremely yeah. difficult yeah. and that's a different situation than, uh, than a single individual that has a, a, a family assets, uh, whether it be real estate, stock investments, what have you. So, uh, No, if, if you don't have so-called assets behind you, mm -hmm. and a whole lot of people don't, mm -hmm. you know what I mean, uh, it's really hard to move anywhere yes. or anything, yes. unless you just need other people to help you all right. the time and so on. Mm -hmm. You know, let, let's talk a little bit more about the issue we've been trying to avoid because it, 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 during an election year it's particular spin and we get a lot of rhetoric about it. Are people to be blamed in one way or another for being a have-not? Right. Are they to be praised for being a have? Hey, if somebody has these huge family wealth and it's just simply handed to them, I mean, what's so good about them being part of the have? Right. You know, they didn't pull themselves up by the bootstraps right. and, you know, or are the people who are have not and against insurmountable odds not able to, right. you know, raise themselves? Should they be berated? I mm -hmm. mean, what's the story here? Well, I'm not running I'm for anything. Are you? I would, yeah, I would uh, would say that there are so many layers to to what you're putting your yeah. finger on here. I mean, there there just is the gap, mm -hmm. and some people feel well, uh, got to there shouldn't be this gap. Right. You know, would that change anything? Well, if there being less of a gap made the people at the bottom feel any better, then I'm afraid that might just be envy. That, that uh, by itself doesn't really do much. If you want to move some of the wealth from the top to the bottom, redistribute it, that raises huge problems. I mean, uh, as we know, I mean, there, there is a progressive income tax, but I don't feel that its justification is only in terms of redistribution. It's in terms of things like fairness and efficiency and a thousand other more uh, pragmatic things. Um, so you don't want to just think about robbing from the rich and giving to the poor. That's known as class envy. And, and in the political season, you hear a lot of reference to that. I, I would hope we can get beyond that and then really look at, at the issues about where to maybe level blame, where to look. And I would just suggest in the equality, inequality issue, what we want is equal opportunity. Right. And that's where we need to be worried about uh, a wealth and income gap in that wealth and income translate to power, to freedom, to opportunity, yeah. and that's where we yeah. need to look. I mm. think I would uh, agree the, the, the prospects of redistribution. You don't want to create perverse incentives. No. Uh, and and uh, you know, I'm, I'm all for the best basketball player in the world making $110 million if that's what the market will bear. And, and so long as everyone has that, that opportunity, I don't think that's necessarily the solution. And I agree, you hear an awful lot about that during, uh, during the, this particular political season. I think along the lines of that opportunity and the access to the opportunity, one of the things that sticks out in my mind, and you actually mentioned yeah. it, uh, but if you were to say what would I think our primary responsibility <coughs> would be as citizens yeah. in this regard, uh, I think the support of of public education, whether you're talking K to 12, mm -hmm. and, and I say that in, ter in terms of if you just look at today mm -hmm. and what CMS has had to do with oh, this budget, right. a CMS, if you were to put it on a business scale, with the growth in the population that we have in this area, and I'm not a paid advisor for, 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 <laughs> for Pete Gorman, yeah. but I can tell you that's running a very difficult business when your inputs have that much in terms of growth, yet you're, ch you're charged with cutting back your budget I believe some $23 million, and, and they're actually cutting teachers, kindergarten teachers, assistant principals. Uh, you know, I, I think in terms of our view on resource allocations as a society, that, that, that the access to a, a sound uh, public education system with teachers that are, com that are committed <coughs> and that can be compensated you know, as we talk about this, haves and have-nots, the, the, the fact of the matter is most of the, of the, of the K-12 teachers are in that less than 50 
thousand uh, dollar category mm -hmm. and I think so it's not only access there keeping a higher education affordable uh, and it becomes a more pertinent topic now when you're talking about gas being four dollars and seventeen cents a gallon mm -hmm. and uh, health care costs being what they are and uh, we're in a, we're in an economy where we've since the beginning of the year we've lost four hundred thirty eight thousand jobs uh, those pop folks are probably thinking of themselves right now as have nots, of regardless course. of what's regardless of what's no being, what's right. Behind. They're not viewing this as the land of equal opportunity. Right. They are viewing right. this as very scary. Right. You know, and talking about scary things, let's let's focus on the home situation. Sure. I mean, that used to be a such a crucial part of the American dream: your ability mm -hmm. to buy a home and to keep that home and to make it something you could be proud of. Right. Some a haven in a heartless world and all of the ideology and surrounding it. But now with this incredible uh, loan scandal and people losing homes and very little modest homes and not being able to enter the market, and even as I watch TV, I go, you know, for my husband and myself, uh, academics have a lot of quote unquote security. We're supposed to be fat and sassy in the <coughs> land of tenure or whatever. Well, you know, we also have a trade-off for that. The increases in salary are tend to be marginal, mm -hmm. two to four percent. Sometimes a big year is five percent, and then we're back into the land of feast. I mean, famine. Mm -hmm. um, so our biggest asset is our home. You turn the TV on, and they're basically telling me, "Well, you can finance your long-term care by going into a reverse mortgage." Or I'm told your house is not worth anything anymore. Whatever price you paid for it, you won't be able to get that. Um, and then, when I look at my sons and you know other young people who, hey, might have their homes taken away from them, what is going on? And I, you know, talk about wanting to blame somebody. I want to blame someone or something. Sure. Or well, uh, I guess this one, it being in the real estate, this yeah. one's probably for me to start. Yeah, it's for <laughs> you. <laughs> for you to, the I, I will. It, we spend a lot of time on the real estate uh, side of the equation, and I, I'm uh, personally involved in real estate here, so it's something near and dear to my heart. But but if you if you remember where we were. Going back maybe three or four years ago, uh, yeah. where you're having discussions with friends uh, at a cocktail party, yeah. and you know they're purchasing properties and perhaps second homes, and based on the anticipation of 25 or 30 percent increase in equity over a one or two year period of time, that was not sustainable. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think, unfortunately, when you start talking about homes, there's an awful lot of emotion that comes oh, yeah. in, that comes into into the equation, and, and even in today's market where we know that that the inventory we're lit, we're sitting on 10 to 11 months of inventory, uh, there are for sale signs everywhere. If you have an individual and you talk to them about listing their home for sale, they are still thinking, "Well, I bought it for four fifteen. I yeah. should be able to sell it for six fifty. And yeah. you know, why are people not walking in the door? Uh, you know, cycles are cycles for a reason, and it took us eight years mm -hmm. to get to where we are. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think some of the trends in real estate had to reverse. Now, if you think when you say your home's not going to be worth anything, I would say, yes, that 25 or 30 percent appreciation annually, that's not sustainable. Uh, but, but you will see, we will come out of this cycle. I, there's good news. No, I'm we've, not worried yeah, yeah, about we, the we, yeah, We've come out of every cycle and, and <laughs> we will, but depending on when you talk to people and where they are, a lot of the loan products were based on the fact that these values would continue to appreciate. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and not only was that not based on fundamentals, I don't think that was, that was sound right. decision making, and, and you cannot absolve people. Uh, not everyone in this loan situation was swindled or scandled. Oh, yeah. Some people just made bad decisions. Can, can just made I bad yeah, ask sure. a question here, though? I mean, I, I, I agree, you know, and, and I do think the individual buyer needs to be realistic and knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. And if the whole premise of the deal I'm trying to put together is that, that there's 20% per annum appreciation and, and some big balloon payment won't kill me at the end, then I got another thing coming. Mm -hmm. My pro or my question is, because you know, I just don't under I, what I don't understand is what happens to mortgages. They're originated, they're bundled, they're sold, they're traded, uh, and apparently, 
on the same kind of assumption of this 10, 15, 20 percent per annum uh, increase so that even the default doesn't bother the one holding the loan if the property has appreciated so much. Well, when the when gravity sets in and the appreciation rate goes to zero, uh, even big players like Bear Stearns can go belly up. And so while I accept responsibility at my level, where is it up there in Wall Street, you know, in, in, in Madison Avenue, wherever it is? I, what I do mean, you think the, about the, that? Just, there are three pieces to that puzzle. There's the origination. There's the packaging and selling and marketing, and then there's the holding. And what you will find is that the players along all of those lines, they're, they're not, I can't tell you necessarily where my mortgage is held. Right. I can tell you where it was originated. Right. I can't tell you who, who holds it or who did the packaging and put together the securitization package behind that. I, I don't. But I do think, and we, when we think about this in terms of, of incentives and who should be punished and who's responsible, when you have a system where the originators are not on the hook for holding any of the credit risks that they originate, and that is the system that we were operating in, I think that is a disincentive to have a sound loan, and it, it gives you the opportunity to deviate from sound lending procedures because, look, I'm going to originate, but I'm going to pass this risk on to you, yeah. and guess what? You may not even know that you hold that risk in your right. in your uh, thrift in your 401k. You may hold it in your uh, stock investment. Mm -hmm. So, uh, my personal view is you'll probably see some change in terms of how mortgages are originated in terms of uh, having the originators have s be, be on the hook, have some, yeah, skin, yeah, ha hook. have some skin in the game for the credit risk that right. would be, I that would be originated. I think skin in the game mm. is really a good one to have because unless mm. we have a feeling of collective responsibility right. or collective kind of punishment, collective reward, right. um, it just puts some people at a very unfair disadvantage. Um, I was just wondering in terms of, you know, the demographics of our society and how rapidly it's aging mm -hmm. and people going to live not into their 70s but into their 90s and so on. And although our fertility rate here in the U.S. is still holding steady in that we're replacing ourselves, um, many European nations are now saying that they're not going to be able to afford the kind of lavish pension programs and so on and so forth they used to have because they don't have enough young people to support mm -hmm. that kind of population. Um, do you see this as an impending kind of situation? I know we talk about Social right. Security and Medicare and Medicaid, right. but there's just so much that can be done when people are living into their 90s. I, I, I think this is another case where personal responsibility, uh, looking at Social Security and, and Medicare right now, I, I can't depend on that, and I don't think my heirs can depend but on that. But here comes so the haves and the have-nots. This is, this I mean, is if the, you're the a have, yeah. you, you can be responsible. You can go yeah. buy long-term care coverage. You can yeah. set up all your little accounts and whatever. Yeah. But if you're living from check to check, I tell you to be individually responsible yes. with my, you know, how does that work? That's uh, particularly today when the, the savings rate is probably where it is amongst the have-nots yeah. because they're on very thin margins. Right. Uh, uh, but again, and, and, and I don't consider myself a, a right-winger by any yeah. choice, but still decisions are being made on a day-to-day -day basis amongst folks that have very limited resources in terms of how they spend their money. Well, I agree. And, that, and, and I think financial education and financial literacy, making sure that people have the understanding, but the decision-making, people still have to abide by their own decisions. Yeah. You know, and that's, yeah, that's sort of where yeah. I come In out. the remaining short time we have, um, I was just thinking, you know, I kind of speaking uh, once again with the divided consciousness on the one hand and saying, gee, like, look, if you don't have much money, how do you expect people to save and do all this mm -hmm. kind of thing? Then, of course, I revert back to my childhood. And we didn't have much money, and yet my parents, you know, through kind of little sacrifices, managed to save enough to send me to college. Uh, you know, and it, it meant that we didn't go on big vacations, we didn't buy cars, we didn't you know, win one car and all those kinds of things, one TV, no new furniture, all those, 
you know, right. kind of quote unquote choices. So I guess that's what you're talking about. On the one hand, I want to say nobody should have to do it the hard way like we did. Right. And well, th well, they're just. I'll, I just to to, to close. I, I yeah. try to practice that. I have a nephew that yeah. thinks that texting is free. <laughs> And he would probably, if you had a choice between him going to school and having lunch and giving up his cell phone to text, uh, he would keep the cell phone to text. Yeah. And that's, I talked, that's a misguided cultural yeah. value. And, uh, and so what I tell him is, look, I'm willing to give you money for X, Y, and Z, but there are certain things I'm not going to give you money for. You have to have that. I, I, uh, you know, my dad did that with me. I'm sure your parents yeah. did that with you. And that's part of the... That's part of the moral fabric yeah, that you grew up with. Yeah, my father used to say, what do you think, money grows on trees? Yeah, yeah, that was his yeah. favorite expression. Exactly. Well, it doesn't. Yeah. I wish it did. I wish it, well, <laughs> hey, if it did, we I wouldn't did. have a gap between yeah. the haves and the have-nots. On the other hand, uh, maybe we'd not have such a good society. There's a reason, you know, that we don't. Do I can to? remember, can you, when the credit card was invented? Oh. Mm. You know, that's what our parents did not have. Right. right. Was a right. credit card. And access to credit. <laughs> and and access to credit. Yeah. I mean, I think those yeah. are those are major societal right. changes, you know. So spend now and pay later. Right. right. I think if at right. All. The few is spend now and, yeah. and pay later. Whereas when <coughs> I was growing up, it was you pay your bills, mm -hmm. and if there was something left over, some of that went to savings, and mm -hmm. then there'd be a little bit of money. And I never really understood that as a kid, what my parents were doing with their strategies. I thought they were just cheap. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it wouldn't give me everything I wanted. Um, but now I realize what they were doing. And I think they were practicing sound resource allocation. Well, we, all, but yeah. we didn't call we it didn't that. We didn't call it that <laughs> at the you time. Know, we just called it, I don't yeah. know what. Uh, well, that's what our economists would call yeah. it. <laughs> Well, yeah, and the solution can't be no credit. And, no. you know, I mean, then we wouldn't even buy homes on mortgages. Yeah. But there does have to be that responsibility piece that, that is just too easily ignored, you know, that, right. that we're worried about in the case of your nephew right. and, and, and credit I, card I, debt. We'll go back, I still think access to a sound, a fundamentally sound education system is the, is the one thing that can level this playing field. Mm -hmm. If you look, the data still points to the fact that education is the primary determinant in terms of how much well, you will earn over your I over want your us career. to end the program <laughs> on that because yeah. I think that's where Dick and I are also that yeah. and the way our society should be. We've got to put our money into that which equalizes opportunity. Absolutely. And it's certainly education and I would add to that health mm -hmm. also that you need sound mind, sound body, then you can do something uh, with the opportunities that come to you. So thank you, Jeff, for Thank you coming. very much. Thank and you very good much. to have you and Dick um, sharing this responsibility. <laughs> I hope you have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.